Bueno, en tanto va entrando la gente, vamos a comenzar eh, de nuevo con la sesión. Ahora vamos a comenzar una sesión de tres ponentes. Eh, la sesión se llama Hormigón Patrimonial, Enfoques, Patologías, Técnicas y Productos de Conservación. El primer ponente eh, va a ser Gani Harbour que es eh, eh, máster por arquitectura por la, el MIT y también eh, tiene un máster en historia por la Universidad de Columbia y, eh, o, o en preservación del patrimonio por la Universidad de Columbia y de historia por la Universidad de Brown. Eh, ha trabajado eh, en muchos eh, digamos, eh, edificios icónicos, incluyendo numerosas obras eh, de eh, Mies van der Rohe y de Frank Joy Wright. Eh, eh, ha recibido distintos premios eh, y es eh, socio fundador tanto de ICOMOS como de DOCOMOMO. Además, ICOMOS en este momento es el presidente eh, del de Grupo de Conservación de Patrimonio del Siglo XX. Y, eh, eh, as, eh, eh, tiene eh, también en DOCOMOMO está dentro de la ejecutiva. Eh, eh, bueno, con esta presentación, pues él va a, a hablar eh, en esta primera sesión eh, sobre la conservación y los eh, retos y los principios eh, para las intervenciones en conservación del de hormigón patrimonial. Thank you, Ita. Can you all, can you, is this working now? Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you. Happy to be here in Spain. I'm sorry my Spanish is non-existent or I would uh, attempt to address you in Spanish, but I don't want to embarrass myself or, or any of you. I wanted to just briefly share with you uh, this morning, it's a loud one, uh, sort of one of, the, one of the aspects that the ICOMOS 20th Century Committee is uh, participating with for this project. So we've already heard a little bit about what cultural heritage is this morning, and the assumption is that everybody in this room uh, knows very well what it is, but one can't always assume that they do. But we need to always remind ourselves about what it is we mean and what we're talking about with cultural heritage. These are just a few examples I think we can all um, imagine others, and I very much appreciated the, the um, keynote earlier about the idea of 2018 being the European Year of Cultural Heritage. I should say uh, also just as a footnote that while I am an American and I'm speaking in English, I'm also a Dane. My father was Danish, so I am actually a European as well. Uh, but I don't think any of you would probably understand my Danish either, so I'm going to stick with English. So what is concrete heritage? Well, it's obviously cultural heritage that has a large component of concrete, whether it's the Pantheon in Rome, which is the one that I always think of. It's my favorite concrete building. Uh, I'm always amazed the fact that the Romans could figure out how to make a dome out of concrete. Or um, some of these other world heritage sites that include uh, Le Corbusier and, and uh, uh, the, the um, Centennial Hall, which we heard about earlier, and then Brasilia, of course, which is a whole city much, made of it, much of it made of concrete, uh, all world heritage. So it's, it's not something new to the, the heritage world. It's something that we have been aware of. But um, this project excited me personally because I see it as one of the critical uh, issues for us moving forward in how to make uh, our, this aspect of heritage safe or at least to, to find out a way to protect it. I don't know how much you need to know about ICOMOS. How many of you, how many of you in the room are a member of ICOMOS? Oh, that's pretty good. How many of you in the room have never heard of ICOMOS? Okay, it's almost the same, okay? So this is not a stupid question. So for those of you that don't know, uh, ICOMOS is, is the leading uh, professional organization in the world, across the world. Uh, bringing together professionals, architects, engineers, educators, uh, people that work in government, a lot of them are from that area, 
and it's 10,000 members. It's a large organization, and we represent 110 national committees. Almost every country, not everyone, but almost every country is represented. Uh, and most significantly, we have 28 scientific committees, and the scientific committees is really where the work gets done. Uh, we were, our, our committee, uh, or ICOMOS itself, was in this wonderful concrete building uh, in Paris. This is still the UNESCO headquarters. We moved out a couple of years ago. I think they couldn't afford the rent anymore, uh, or we at least got pushed out. But anyway, it, I, I, this is a pretty well-preserved building, but also a great um, icon for us to look at and, and see that it is a serious thing for uh, ICOMOS as a whole to think about concrete heritage. So the 20th Century Committee is specifically looking at 20th Century heritage. We work uh, collaboratively with Dokomomo. How many of you are a member of Dokomomo? Or know what Do who here knows what Dokomomo is? Yeah, more than ICOMOS, okay. So Do Dokomomo's focus has, has traditionally been about modern movement heritage. Um, that, that's expanded a little bit, and depending on their uh, national committee, it, it can vary. In the United States, we actually have a very expansive definition of what modernism is. Um, but nonetheless, there was a, f a, f a thought that perhaps Dokomomo wasn't necessarily addressing uh, much of the heritage from the 20th century that we wanted to make sure was getting covered, like Art Nouveau and uh, Art Deco and just, just average uh, cultural heritage from that period. Some of the things that we saw uh, earlier the, in the, the uh, keynote, maybe. So our intent was to cover all that thing, including the Momo, but uh, to work collaboratively with Dokomomo on, on those kinds of issues where we had um, joint ideas. So one of the things that our committee has done, uh, largely thanks to my, my very good friend and colleague, Fernando Espinosa, sitting in the front row, was to hold a, um, a very important meeting here in Madrid in 2011. And uh, it was a very successful conference. And out of that conference came something known as the Madrid Document. And the Madrid, Madrid Document uh, was intended to give guidance about how to treat architectural heritage of the 20th century. Because in Spain and many other places, there was really not a, um, a way or a document that people could refer to that would help them uh, guide them in the way to approach and to treat uh, these important uh, sites, buildings, and sites. This was updated in 2014, uh, translated to about eight languages, and uh, most recently in our New Delhi meeting that uh, ICOMOS just had last fall, we expanded uh, the cultural heritage topic to not just architectural heritage, but to be all kinds of heritage. And so we had to change the language of the document, which was a little bit cumbersome, but nonetheless we got there. So in 2017, we, we created the Madrid New Delhi document. Who here has read the Madrid New Delhi document? Anybody? I have. Okay, well, it's online. It's online. It's very available to you. And I would recommend that you, you take a good look at that, particularly those of you that are professionals um, and thinking about these issues. So what I'm going to share now is, is something that's related to that. I'm not going directly from the Madrid New Delhi document, but using that as the, as the um, a lead to talk about some of these principles that we're talking about. One of our main deliverables for this project is to create a benchmarking document to look at heritage concrete. And you'll hear more specifically about that um, later today. But I wanted to just give you more about the overall principles of how we see dealing with these things. Um, the first, of course, is to identify and assess the cultural significance of the, of the thing you're talking about. And in, this is a little complicated because every country has a little different way of looking at it. Some countries um, don't even really have a matter of which to address this. Europeans, in general, have a pretty advanced way of looking at it, but across the world it's not always the same. So does your country have an age limit? I don't even know. Does Spain have an age limit? Is there, is there a limitation? of how old something can be before it can be considered heritage and put on a list and actually protected. Of course, this is the, the goal is to find a means, a way to actually protect these things. Um, even in my country, if it gets listed on the National Register, it doesn't actually protect it 
uh, from being ruined or demolished unless federal funds are being used. There's always sort of a catch to it. So what are the criteria? I think, I think in general, even for concrete heritage, we need to think about the criteria, the way, the, the aspects that we're looking at need to be kept the same. We should always have a consistency so that we understand uh, how we're approaching these things so that they look similar. We need to proactively develop inventories. This is one of the biggest problems is that, that we are not aware of all of the different sites and places that need to be thought of. And the only way to do it is to actually go out and look and find these places. And this is often expensive and uh, it usually has to be done by governments. It's very difficult for organizations that, um, are un, you know, volunteer organizations to do it. You really have to rely on governments and it typically starts at a local level and then spreads out from there. Uh, but it's a very, very important thing. Again, the Europeans have been very good about that, um, but there's always more work that can be done. And it, it's something that needs to be updated because we're always moving forward in time. So a survey or an inventory that was done 20 years ago, and now there's things that have come, come of age, shall we say, or have become more um, important over that time period, and those need to be reflected in the current inventory. So they have to be updated, which is very difficult to get people to spend money to do that. And we also um, encourage the use of a comparative analysis, again, so you can keep a consistency and an understanding when we talk about significance, what does it mean? What does that actually mean? Um, you need to apply appropriate conservation planning and management methodology. This sounds logical, but uh, needs to be reminded. We need to be reminded of it. And the key aspect of this, of course, is to do your research and know your resource. In other words, you got to get the information, uh, the most information that you can so that you can have the best understanding possible of that resource that you're talking about. Otherwise, you, are, you will be lost. Use an interdisciplinary team of experts. This is also critical. We can't do it all alone. You can't just have a historian. You need an engineer. You need an architect. You need a landscape architect, sometimes a city planner if it's a bigger um, site that you're talking about. Uh, whatever expertise you need, don't hesitate to go and find the right people, people that know um, the, the topic that you're talking about, and you will get a very good result from that. And also re respect the um, innovation and in design. This is something that, especially with concrete, we want to be very aware of uh, new ideas and things that made concrete the important material that it is. Research the technical planning aspects of the 20th century. Again, this relates to that idea of knowing uh, any special aspects that might have occurred in order to create that heritage. And then, for, and then the last part of this, the mock-up. So you want to do the planning and the research on the technical side. And in order to really figure out what's the best thing to do as far as do treatments is to make mock-ups. And in, in our, our practice, and I'm a practicing architect, this is the key to success for any project that we do. And you probably do it here as well. Um, but you'd be surprised how many times it's not done. And the result is that you're basically guessing. So you have to spend the time and the research, sometimes it's a year in advance of a project, to figure out how do you make the correct mix for concrete? How do you do that? And the only way you know is by trying and failing and trying and failing until finally you get it correct. You need to develop policies to conserve the significance. And this is often done in something called a, a conservation management plan. Um, I put up here the, the Sydney Opera House because they're in some ways the leading uh, at least to my knowledge, that they've done this more than anyone. They've, I think they've done four conservation management plans since this became World Heritage. They renew it every five years, which is great. I don't know a client in the United States that would pay you to do that, but at least in Sydney, the, um, the government sees the value of this because they understand that, that situations change and you have to be able to adapt your plan in order to accommodate the way that you're thinking about it and how it gets used. So you need to be very aware um, of how to keep those policies straight in order to, to adjust your, your conservation methods. And, it, and related to that, of course, is this idea of change. Because no matter how much we'd like to think we can protect and preserve and restore something and then protect and keep it, it's going to change, whether it's Mother Nature uh, whether it's development pressures, 
whether it's small changes made over a long period of time. Uh, sometimes the building codes make you do changes that you don't otherwise want to do. And now, of course, uh, everyone is aware of the, the catastrophic change that can come with environmental change, flooding and, and increased uh, problems with the weather. And then, of course, a fire or war, which is, uh, of course, a man-made disaster. These are the things that you need to be prepared for and ready for uh, dealing with if they should come to affect the site you're worried about. When you do engage with change, you need to be very sensitive about it. You need to think about the thing you have. You've done all your research. You know your resource. And now you have to engage with it. How do you do that in a way that's sensitive to it? You, need to, you, need, you have a program. You have a, uh, uh, some desire on the part of the owner to make some change. They need to do it for a use reason. They need to do it for the codes or whatever it is. Be sensitive. Think slowly. Take, take your time. Do as little as possible, but only as much as necessary. That's, that's one of our biggest uh, credos that we use to, in talking about our work, and I think it's, it's the way that all heritage professionals think about what they're doing. And be innovative. You need to be, I've often had this debate in, in the States anyway, where architects, other architects, don't see heritage work as being all that creative. It's not really design work. But in fact, it's extremely creative because you have to solve a problem uh, and come up with a solution that no one else has had to do necessarily before. Every, every project has its own distinct thing. So there's a lot of creativity, and you need to use that creativity to come up with good solutions. Uh, ensure a respectful approach to additions. Now, this is also very controversial and, um, and done in many different ways. The Europeans have always been uh, quite good at this, and I just thought of a better example than I'm going to show you now. But um, you know, you you are you are uh, you have very talented architects that often can come up with a great new solution to making an intervention that is true to the new and true to the old, and that's really what you're trying to find a way to do to do that in a balanced way, so that the all the heritage values of the existing place are kept and understood. And then um, the new intervention is also read as being something as a positive attribution of new, a new addition. There are a lot of things you don't want to do, and, and that's what I have as an example here. This is a current controversy in the States. Um, I hate to keep using US examples, but those are the ones I know the best. This is an important library by Marcel Breuer in Atlanta, Georgia. It's precast panels. The, 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 the facade is all precast panels of concrete. And you can see it, it's a very typical Breuer-esque building. Well, someone thought it would be wonderful to bring more light in, so they were going to remove all these panels and bring in more light. Well, this, at least for us, is not a good idea. And um, they've been having a very big fight in Atlanta over this. And uh, fortunately, it looks like what the result is going to be is that that costs too much. Therefore, they're not going to do it. So we're happy with, that's the reason we're happy with the result. Recognize when use contributes significance and uh, manage it accordingly. Well, sometimes you're really lucky. Like in this case, this is the Unity Temple by Frank Lloyd Wright in Oak Park. Um, it was built in 1908. It's, it's, I think there's not a more important concrete building in the world. It's ma it was made out of uh, cast-in-place concrete. It's not the earliest one, but it's a really important one. It was built by a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and they still use the building every day. Uh, that's, that's the ideal situation. It's not always what you're able to do. It's important to find a use that actually can work within the building. When you try to put something in a building that doesn't work, it's not going to have a success. So you, you need to be sensitive to that and try to find a way to work with your building owner to make sure that their plans for the building are going to align with what is possible. Because not every building is adaptable to every other use. There are certainly a lot of flexibility, but it isn't always um, whatever you want to do. Respect the authenticity and integrity of the site, of the place or site. You need to think about more than just the building itself. You need to think about the landscape that surrounds it, or the, in, in the city, sometimes it's a hardscape of the, of the um, uh, built, other built things around it and to, to understand that whatever you're doing is, is um, going to be, again, a positive attribute, not something that takes away. 
And you also need to think about the layers of change. As, as these sites get to be older, things, interventions happen, and sometimes they take on a meaning of their own, and you need to be uh, very uh, clear about recognizing that and honoring that. Um, these are just to show, this is a very important um, uh, World Heritage Site. It's the uh, University in, in Mexico City. And it's all about the buildings and the places in between the buildings. It's a beautiful site, and they, they actually take care of this quite well. Uh, if you've never been there, I highly recommend going. Number 10 is give, give consideration to environmental sustainability. Well, this is a big issue. We heard it mentioned uh, before in the, the, the talk about the, the 2020 Horizon Project. It's something that all of us as professionals are thinking about, all of us as citizens are thinking about. We need to be very aware of, of what does this mean. And uh, because buildings are such a big user of energy, how, do, how can we find ways to do that in a sensitive way? This is an important question. There's a lot of things you can do that don't actually have to impact the physical building to save energy, like changing the, light, the way the type of light fixtures you use or um, adding insulation where you can without seeing it and things like that. But you need to be very cautious not to make bad, bad improvements that actually affect this, the building in a detrimental way. And I believe that we need to figure out where is the compromise between a reasonable, uh, a reasonable assessment or idea about making that changes to the building to make it more sustainable uh, where you begin to erode the values of the building by doing so. And that, that's not always so easy, but it's something we need to take into account. And we should also recognize that heritage values have also a value of sustainability to society. And I think you need to think about it in a broader context, not just about energy. Promote and celebrate the 20th century cultural heritage with a wider community. Well, that's why we're here today, right? Um, provide professional, um, pr provide educational opportunities for professionals. So this is why these workshops are so important to us because it's a way to outreach and to get more people involved and to understand what it is we're all talking about and what we're trying to do. And in particular, um, on this topic, ECOMOS 20th Century Committee and Dogomomo are the two leading groups. There are others as well. Uh, the UIA, um, Tiki as it's known, that deals with industrial heritage is a very important group that we like to work with as well. Uh, because we don't want to forget about that. And then with concrete, there's a lot of sites that they're also interested in. So we want to work with them on these important topics. So challenges, what are, the, what are the challenges that we face? Well, there are many, and I'm only going to talk about a couple here. But I think that the biggest important, the most important one, and the hardest one, is this one. The general public hate these buildings. At least that's my experience. They say, it's ugly, I don't understand it. How could you possibly like that building? Uh, why don't they just tear it down? Let's get rid of it. So th this is the first hurdle that you have, that you have to, have to make a, a case for the buildings. You have to be able to explain it in terms that they can understand to say, well, I get you might not think it's the most beautiful building, but you have to understand who, who designed this building and what the building was trying to, um, what was it trying to be when it was created and what does it meant to people who have used it since then. And then you have to find good examples of, of uh, buildings that have had success. What I like to do is, is turn, it on the, turn it over to the other person and I say, well, what's a building you do like? And ask them what they like and why do they like that building? And then you try to find the attributes or the values of a building like this uh, and say, well, this has some of those attributes too. You may not think it's pretty, you may not like think it's aesthetically pleasing, but it has these other aspects to it that make it important, and that's why we should be thinking about saving it and finding another way to use it. This building in, in particular, this was damaged in a hurricane, and um, this, the county hated it, or at least some people did. And I don't have the after picture, but they left the, basically they left the concrete frame, but you would never know it was the same building today. So they've completely transformed it in a bad way. Um, when these buildings become at risk, what do we do about it? Well, the 20th Century Committee has a program that we call, uh, we call the Heritage Alert System. Uh, we, we also do write letters for things. This is a beautiful complex of buildings in Norway. You think the Norwegians would be a little more um, uh, enlightened, and in general they are. 
Uh, but this is a government building that the government wants to tear down because it has um, a lot of connotations with that horrible uh, terrorist attack, the crazy man that killed all those young people, and he blew up a bomb in this building, and the, actually in the, the high-rise tower to the right, which they're keeping, but they want to tear down the low-rise building because they are worried about how to protect it. At least that's what they say. And this is now a battle that's been going on for about three years, and when every time they change a government, we are not quite sure whether they're going to save the building or not. So we're a little hopeful that maybe the new government will be a little more lenient, and um, uh, we keep trying to fight that. But there are many of these examples all over the world. Uh, sometimes we have success. There was a, a project in, in Hong Kong where we got involved and they actually saved that they were going to tear it down. The government was going to tear it down and build a, another Hong Kong high rise. And um, through, through political pressure and understanding that there was an alternative, they actually saved the building and then they reinvested in the building. And that, that's a great success story that we're happy to share. Another big topic is socialist heritage. This, this is another one where um, it's very difficult to get people who have a very emotional and reactionary uh, uh, feeling about these things to understand that they need to, they need to put that a little bit aside and look at it in the broader context of societal culture in, the, in a big sense and in the European sense maybe to say, okay, this is a period you maybe want to forget about, but on the other hand, it's something that is important and needs to be remembered. And there was actually quite a bit of good architecture that was created in that period. And that's, that's what, there's a, there's a very significant movement uh, to celebrate this. It's also part of our, our uh, Innova Concrete Initiative and in that we have a couple of our case study projects are specifically selected because it represents uh, this, this um, socialist heritage period. And uh, it's again, a, a matter of educating people to understand why you would think that that's something to save. And as I mentioned before, the sustainability issues, it's, it's, in our, it's already in our um, dec decision about principles, but it is also one of our biggest challenges. And it's more than, than just the, the fact that the climate change is going to affect all of us in a really fundamental way. It, it is also difficult for us to deal with it in, in the sense of how do you engage with the building. Um, I, I see that as one of the, the most critical design challenges that we have as professionals. How do we find ways to make the buildings perform without ruining them or without uh, lessening their aesthetic value and some of the other aspects of them that might, might be something that we're trying to save. And then uh, last but not least, and this is again why we're here today, is the challenges of material deterioration. Concrete is a fabulous material. It, it made so much possible, but it's got a lot of problems. And these are just a few of them. And you're going to hear much more about that uh, from my friend and colleague, Paul Gaudet, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the, some of the aspects of concrete that, if you, th if, you thought a, if you thought a brutalist building was ugly just by itself, when it looks like this, it's very hard to love it. Um, and it also, it, it, it creates real, real problems in the, the technical aspects of how to fix them. So I'm very happy to be uh, involved with this Innova Concrete Initiative. I think that if we can find ways to, to keep from getting them this bad that we uh, can arrest and, and, de and defer or, or at least uh, keep, keep them from getting this bad because once they get this bad there's not a lot of good options. Uh, I think that we will have had a lot of success so I'm very pleased to be here and, and to be part of this, this great project. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. This speaker is Paul Godet, a civil engineer that uh, works uh, in a very uh, big company uh, devoted uh, to the uh, engineer uh, uh, works. Ah, tengo que hablar en español. <laughs> Eh, eh, él es ingeniero civil y es experto en patología. Eh, ha trabajado en cientos de eh, edificios y cientos de problemáticas eh, de estructuras, en, no solo en hormigón, sino en otro tipo de materiales, en fábrica de ladrillos, en madera, etcétera, etcétera. <coughs> Tiene numerosas publicaciones realizadas y eh, tiene una importante labor eh, en, en el American Concrete Institute en, en el sentido de normalización. Eh, además, ha eh, facilitado numerosos procedimientos eh, de, eh, de conservación en distintos tipos de hormigón patrimonial. Y ya eh, él va a hablarnos pues, de lo que Gani acaba de decir, de patología, <laughs> etc. Thank you. I'm always afraid someone's telling a joke about me and I would never know and just sit there and smile. <laughs> Uh, first, it's an honor to be here. I wanted to thank uh, Maria and her Inova Concrete team uh, for organizing this and my hosts here in uh, Madrid. Once again, it's, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to present my talk on concrete pathology, uh, the character, characteristics and the properties of concrete heritage. There's a broad range of concrete um, that I work on. Uh, these are just three, um, three projects. Uh, one's Mies van der Rohe's first uh, private building, which happened to be concrete, uh, post-World War II. Uh, there was not a lot of steel to be used. Um, the other one's part of a, what's called a Mission 66 project um, by the National Park Service in Chicago <coughs> that built these park facilities all across the country. And on, the, on your right is the uh, Errol Saarinen uh, Morrison Urza Stiles Building in Yale University in New Haven. Uh, the conservation strategy uh, for concrete uh, conservation strategy for concrete heritage. Um, uh, Gunny covered some of these. Uh, these are being developed as part of a um, as part of a benchmark document um, that's in the is being discussed at this time. But generally, um, this is where it is. First, to develop the knowledge and understanding of cultural um, significance of concrete, to determine the significance of the concrete, identify the project team. Um, one thing I'd like to um, add to the project team is I tend to work with uh, contractors also during the process uh, because it's very often to understand the constructability um, of a project. Uh, perform the research. Um, I will focus in on the assessment which has to do with observations in the field, condition survey, and laboratory analysis. And then uh, develop a conservation plan and the various repair options and approaches. And develop the repair program and then implementation, which is the construction, and then the uh, maintenance plan and monitoring program post uh, repair work. And these are the four areas I'm gonna focus in on uh, for this presentation. <coughs> Uh, the first thing I look at um, when I'm working on a project is what, what is the vintage or age of the structure. Um, oftentimes there's different technologies at different times. Um, so I tried to cover the full range from um, the 19th century forts along uh, coastal forts or fortifications along um, the seashore to a remote uh, fish hatchery and, and education center in Alaska in the 1930s. Um, the 1950s at Lake Caborciers, uh, building in Chandigarh, India, to a, uh, a very common um, kind of boring building um, in suburban America, which is just as a precast architectural concrete. 
Some of the things I look for uh, right away um, after I, I look at the age are the characteristics. The architectural details, um, whether it's a form board finish, exposed aggregate, uh, what type of variability do you have in the surface? What are the conditions you have to, to match? Um, and how many different mixes you're gonna have to develop? What are you actually trying to match? And then placement techniques that were originally used um, in what you're gonna do in the future and then the variable appearance. Uh, one, of the one of the biggest challenges with repairing concrete is trying to um, not come up with a consistent appearance but match the variability um, that exists in the existing uh, concrete. Um, up on the right is a very simple monument and the lower right is uh, John J. Early's Baha'i House of Worship, um, a very prominent um, architect in the uh, concrete arena. So the, the four different types of distress that we commonly see are material related deterioration, um, corrosion related deterioration, structural distress, um, and I've added construction defects. Uh, typically there's three types, but often you, you have to meet the challenges of what the original construction uh, might be. Uh, first is cracking, um, often the most difficult to deal with. Um, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the origin? Is it a problem and how to repair it? Uh, three difficult questions. On the left is, is um, one of the worst I've seen. Luckily on this, this was the uh, parging or rendering that was applied to the surface. So the, the cracking uh, wasn't very deep. It was a, a failed repair project. Um, on the right uh, hap is an ashlar finish from about 1900 um, that uh, had cracked and then the, uh, the outside layer had begun to fall off um, in a seismic zone. Another mater a material related problem has to do with freeze thaw deterioration. Um, this happens to be a, a fountain, a mid century fountain, where the, the concrete had begun to severely deteriorate uh, due to freeze thaw deterioration. And, and that's with, once the concrete is critically saturated, which is less than fully saturated, um, it goes through cyclic freezing and thawing. Um, that adds up to concrete deterioration. It's funny in the uh, area I come from is, um, which is Chicago, which is about in the middle of the United States, um, it, it seems as though the freeze-thaw areas are moving further north, because usually it's, it's the area where you go above and below freezing are the areas that are most uh, critically hurt uh, by freeze-thaw damage. But those areas within at least my country appear to be changing, moving northward. A corrosion-related deterioration usually shows itself by first corrosion of the steel, um, the expansive forces crack the concrete around it, um, which first shows itself as a, as a crack, uh, then delamination um, of the concrete, and then eventual spalling, which is the coming off of the concrete. Uh, that being said, um, with what we're talking about today uh, with, co with concrete heritage, um, oftentimes there's been previous repair work. Um, and that has become one of the biggest challenges with our uh, work today is how to investigate um, previous repairs. And usually um, what, what I look for is the surface preparation that was used, uh, the type of rep repair materials um, that was used. Um, usually, you know, in the past, there's a magic material that comes along and maybe an inappropriate material is put on, is how to judge that. Does it come off? Does it remain? Um, what's the remaining service life? Um, oftentimes, two products are used, protection systems are installed that may not have a long service life. Um, and in many cases, um, you can see where previous repairs have done damage to the original surface, um, thinking that they're doing the right thing and providing more protection. What's worst is when you have an irreversible repair. Um, just two examples, the one on the left is that line with all the cracking. Um, you can see how they actually put staples on um, the face to try and, um, a little bit like it went to the hospital and got stitched up after a rough hockey game. But, um, and on the right is uh, Santa Claus, um, the original in the middle, and on the right it was dressed up over time to make it look more festive. Um, and uh, once again, an irreversible repair, uh, where it was very, on the right, I think they were, they, they're thinking about stripping the paint off, but they, they um, I doubt if they'll do that. 
I won't cover this in much detail, um, but I did want to go over some of the, the basics of what, he, of what are used in field testing, and then I'll go on to some case studies. But, but typically in this type of work, um, there's visual testing and sound testing. Those are the two basic uh, baseline um, techniques that are used and are probably the most important. Um, then you get into uh, measuring and quantification of data, which has to do with determining the size and type of cracks, um, metal detectors, corrosion testing, hardness testing, um, to try and figure out what your compressive strength is, um, impact echo, ground penetrating radar, and, and the list goes on and on, um, getting more and more complicated. Um, and usually more than one test is done, usually three, four, um, because one test does not give you an answer. Usually it's a combination of different tests which provide you with the answer. One thing um, uh, that I, I cannot emphasize enough is, is exploratory openings. This is Errol Saarinen's stairs at the uh, St. Louis Arch. Um, and uh, the, it's, oftentimes it's very difficult to understand existing conditions. So we're possible to be, be able to probe and actually find out what's there. Um, Gunny mentioned uh, mock-ups before, uh, which I think are very important. Probably the next one in importance is an inspection opening to really find out what's there, calibrate your non-destructive evaluation. With laboratory testing, um, once again, there's many things you can do. There's some baseline tests that most people use. Uh, petrographic analysis, testing for carbonation, um, air content, if you're in a freeze-thaw environment. Uh, cement content and type, chloride, freeze-thaw, and alkali aggregate reactivity. And a lot of these depend on your local region, uh, where you're located. Sometimes the aggregates will be a problem, the environment will be a problem, um, and you really wanna tailor uh, your testing to your region you're from, the type of concrete, the type of exposure, things of that nature. And usually if you are working with a, a petrographer or someone who works in this arena, um, it's, especially you wanna, it's always best to work with someone from that area uh, because they will know the aggregates, they will know the cement sources, they will know the problems that tend to occur. Uh, carbonation, a very simple test. Uh, probably one of the more important tests to do is um, oftentimes it's done with phenolphthalein, uh, and that basically tests the depth or, or it tests the pH level within the concrete. Uh, as you can see on the one on the right, that's a freshly fractured surface. A very small amount of it um, is carbonated, and the pH, the uh, high levels of pH are what protect the steel within the concrete and prevent corrosion. Another interesting um, thing is with development of mixed design, this can be used. Um, and there, there are different types of tests you can do to, to develop your mix, your original mix um, from, from years ago. This happened to be about, 19, about 1910, uh, this concrete, and it was, it was meant to mimic um, granite, a dark uh, granite. And uh, these were the components that were developed. And this can be done with different types of tests to break down your materials. Um, just quickly, I'm not gonna cover this in, in too much detail, but I just wanna go over, these are the, like the normal kind of generalized um, steps when it comes to concrete repair is usually to saw cut the perimeter, um, chip out the concrete to some depth, um, typically uh, beyond the reinforcing steel so you have a mechanical attachment of your new area, your new, uh, your new patch. Abrade and clean the exposed concrete and steel, um, add, or supplement the existing st embedded steel. Replace the steel as required. And then um, install formwork to match the original concrete, place and cure concrete, and, and sometimes uh, use a protection system. Now this is standard repair work. Um, but in something more critical, um, such as concrete heritage, um, these are some of the additional steps you, know, you probably wanna take. Um, you wanna make sure it's tailored to each project. Um, you probably want to use more testing, uh, laboratory testing, in your assessment and your development of repair techniques. Um, you definitely want to use a high level of craftsmanship. If you're, if you're training a contractor during the project, it's probably too late. Um, really, it, it's important to use uh, you know, contractors and craftsmen who are experienced 
in the type of work you're doing. It's, it's different than new construction. Um, it takes more creativity. It takes uh, probably a little bit less speed um, than you would build a high rises to repair um, concrete. Um, collaboration and experience of the whole project team is important. Um, ma matching the color, texture, and finish of the original existing concrete. I think that's a good baseline to work from. Create samples and mock-ups, um, and also plan the time that's needed for mock-ups in the review and approval process. Every time I haven't done a mock-up or I've skipped it, I've always, I've always regretted it. Um, and and it, you know, for the next year of the project, you just wanna kick yourself um, that you, you didn't take the time to do a mock-up. I think Gunny was right on when he said, um, if, you, if, you don't, if the mock-up's not successful, it's not time to start. And then define the expectations. I'm just gonna go through a couple of quick case studies um, to describe um, this from beginning to end. One thing I did wanna mention is um, uh, these, uh, both these projects were done with highly skilled craftsmen. Um, so it's probably not at an ordinary level. Um, I, once again, I'm a firm believer in the, the level of craftsmanship is paramount to a successful project. Um, this was by uh, Minoru Yamasaki uh, and built in 1964. Um, Yamasaki's uh, famous for uh, many buildings. He's probably most well known for the World Trade Center that came down in 2001. This is the, uh, um, the building we're gonna look at. This is a, uh, a temple on the shores of Lake Michigan. Um, luckily, uh, uh, Balthazar uh, Korab was the photographer. We were so lucky to find original photographs um, taken by a famous photographer. That rarely happens. Um, in this case, it, it, they, they kept telling us they had no photographs until they opened up this file and found these uh, archival high quality photographs which were essential to the project. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this was the original construction. It was a combination of uh, precast and cast in place, and you can see these delicate pieces of the main uh, temple being put together, and it's really scary to look at it, um, how they were kept stable at the time, and you can see how the, how the, uh, the points at the bottom, uh, once again, how they were kept together, I'm not sure, uh, during construction, but obviously it was, uh, it was done carefully. Here's what we're gonna focus in on are the, um, We're gonna focus in on these panels right here. These are precast panels, um, which are really a signature of, of this architect. He's used them on many buildings. Um, very difficult um, to repair because uh, there's one bar in each one of these protruding areas um, along the edges. And uh, there's the original section of that um, concrete element. Stay away from that. Um, typical, um, cracking due to corrosion related deterioration. Uh, once again, because it's the, the bar is surrounded by three sides, it's unconfined on three sides. It, it pops off very readily and the concrete will spall away uh, very quickly. And you can see on the right where some of it has moved away. Some previous repairs that were done, um, this is usually difficult on some projects because um, the owner does not wanna remove them um, because there's costs involved, but. I've always found when they're really ugly, it's easier um, to get the owner to uh, agree to, to remove them. Um, some of these were reasonable, but most of them uh, came off. We just did some basic laboratory studies, petrographic analysis, carbonation, chloride content, um, and we also used it to help with the mixed design. Basically, this was a carbonation-related problem. Uh, there was no acid cleaning that was done, so the chloride levels were, weren't, weren't that extreme. Uh, but mostly it was carbonation related. Some cleaning samples were done before the matching uh, was performed. Uh, just simple um, biocides and detergents were used. Um, in this case, usually it is the paste um, where the dirt collects. Obviously, visually, this is aggregate dominant. Um, and usually these are a little bit easier to match because the aggregate is a stable color. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier so mixed design samples, I won't go through much of this, except to say many, many samples were done. And uh, 
finally getting to the point where it was close um, was really the key. We did use two different, um, two different mixes because of the leeward side and uh, windward side of the building had basically two different looks to it. And the repair of the concrete is basically, this was a ground supported uh, project, so it's fairly straightforward. But removing the areas, you can see how all the way around the reinforcing bar was, was unconfined. So basically it would break out that way and it was thought to be the most durable repair by doing that. And also the joints were hidden within transitions of the direction of the concrete. You see the formwork being installed on the right. And then the contractor uh, putting in the duct bills or spouts to catch the concrete, placing it in. Um, a retarder was used, a uh, paint on retarder on the inside of the formwork and also some surface finishing techniques were used upon removal of the formwork. You can see the contractors removing the formwork and beginning his trial work um, and it came, out, it came out very well. But this is, you're only seeing the, the successful part, not all the trials and tribulations that led up to this. But it was a long process, but luckily the owner um, was fine with the schedule. And really the schedule is the driver on a lot of this. Um, here's here's uh, towards the end, and you can see the, uh, what was difficult on this too was the curved part um, of the concrete. Usually the more architecturally detailed the concrete is, the more difficult it is um, to place the concrete in the proper spot. And here it is complete. Um, one more project. This is a much more complicated project. This is a done by John J. Early, um, a real famous uh, engineer architect in, in the US um, who developed these different mixes. And then this has nine different mixes. And this is a monument to the light bulb, the famous light bulb. And you can see there's actually a light bulb at the top. John J. Early also did um, some famous parks in Washington DC. He did the famous Meridian Hill uh, Park that we're working on right now. On the right is the uh, Baha'i House of Worship. And on the right is some of the uh, precast um, that they made for it. Uh, he was famous for um, the technique of using uh, precast as formwork, and it would be stay in place formwork. And it was only five centimeters thick, reinforced. And it's really hard to repair because typically today your sizes double that for precast panels. And so, precasters, it's very hard to convince precasters to do this work. Um, but we were successful on this one. Uh, but you can see some of the very delicate precast that was used as formwork and then concrete was placed behind it. And I'll, sh I'll show you how that was done. So the investigation was done by both uh, rope and um, lift. Inspection openings were made. Um, this happened to be in some panels that were going to be fully removed uh, because they had deteriorated due to freeze thaw internally. And I'll show you what that, how that happened in a second. But, you, but what we're looking for were the connections from the precast to the concrete itself because we wanted to reuse um, some of those connections. Here's some of the areas of deterioration, um, very common corrosion related deterioration. Um, the biggest problem had to be with, uh, had to do with freeze thaw though. There was over the course of the whole monument, there really wasn't a lot of, of deterioration. Um, one thing we did have is with this type of technique, it's almost like you're, you're dealing with a precast um, or masonry type of uh, structure and it's concrete because you have joints. And so even though it is cast in place, it has that precast facade, which is fully monolithic, you still have joints. So it's kind of an unusual combination of um, elements. And freeze thaw damage and, um, and some of the different elements that are, you can see why there was uh, so much area. Those, these are very small elements here. Um, you can see this is the outside layer of the precast, and then this is the cast in place concrete behind it. So in section, uh, what it actually was, this is the inside of the monument, this is the outside of the monument. So this is the precast, which is five centimeters. So the outside two centimeters um, was the face mix and then the backup mix. And the backup mix was the problem. The backup mix 
basically came apart in several areas and the, would blow out the front layer. So there was really no way to get to it. Um, here's some of the different mixes. This is near the top. You can see some of the blue aggregate that's used to make it look whiter. And this, this is near the bottom where you have a buff color. Some cleaning samples were done. Um, luckily, uh, all we really had to do was use a, a detergent or no, we just water clean, very low pressure water. So the concrete, there was nine different mixes that were used and it went from black at the bottom to white at the top. And, and something I learned, I didn't know at the time, white is actually something you, you put in some sky blue or you know, light blue aggregate that makes it look whiter. Um, and that's the L at the top. So samples were taken off of different one. And then um, the contractor had a, a, a gentleman, Robert Armbruster of the Armbruster Company, um, sourced the aggregate, um, did the samples, um, and came up with a different um, type of mix designs for it. This was actually done before the contractor started the project. So this was done as a, um, because it was a government project and there's certain controls, it's very hard sometimes to get that time or to come up with do a complex project on a government project. Uh, the decision was made to do it beforehand. Some trial repairs were done, many, many trials or repairs were done um, and then eventually um, conventional concrete repairs were done uh, but for uh, the concrete uh, to do it with the architectural concrete so breaking behind the bars using the formwork with a uh, retarder and then here's the result uh, once the core once the forms have been removed is uh, patches that matched fairly well the precast was a different story um, at the top, the precast was heavily deteriorated. And just an example of how this system worked was the precast, this is the original precast. And then behind it was where the cast in place concrete was placed. And you can see in this situation, which was the top of the monument, it would be very hard to get the concrete to flow without having voids. So of course there were voids and that's where the deterioration occurred. Um, as you can see in this, the photograph, it was heavily, heavily deteriorated. Um, it may not look at it this time, but um, it was to the point where it had to be replaced. Um, so the precaster, uh, precast um, plant was, manufacturer was involved. Um, the idea was is to make the, the original precast, you can see it's been stripped. Um, this was just using retarders once again. Um, to expose the aggregate along with some surface finishing. Here's the whole group of them. And here they are being put in place uh, with a lift, with a large crane. And here it is uh, today. Now, one interesting thing about concrete um, heritage is um, when I first came up with these, these black areas at the bottom were all painted white. Um, a team of Boy Scouts or a, a children's group came out one day um, on, a set, on a weekend and decided it was best to paint all these white. Um, but, luck, but fortunately, those had to come off anyway, so they were all replaced. But it was just kind of a funny story. But here we are today, and I think it, looked, uh, it was quite a good project for the uh, city. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Luego haremos el coloquio eh, más tarde eh, cuando hacer la presentación eh, Antonio Teba. Antonio, tienes que ponerte esto. ¿Vas a sentarte o no? no. ¿Reconoces tú mismo la mitad de la presentación? Bueno, sí. El siguiente ponente va a ser Antonio Teba.
es licenciado en ciencias químicas y ha trabajado en distintas empresas. Él tiene un máster en, en plásticos y cauchos y ha trabajado en distintas empresas en general relacionadas con el, la producción de materiales para la construcción y para la reparación. En la actualidad trabaja en SICA y es eh, líder de los proyectos eh, más de eh, en SICA a nivel global. Él ahora va a hablar de, eh, el hormigo, de, de productos de reparación en la industria y sistemas de reparación. Buenos, buenos días a todos. Eh, menos mal que la charla es en español, sino después de las dos charlas en inglés y vais a notar un acento distinto, ¿no? Pero bueno, eh, quiero en primer lugar dar las gracias a la... Universidad de Cádiz por haber tenido en cuenta y habernos eh, ofrecido estar en este proyecto del cual estamos muy interesados y por supuesto muchas gracias al Instituto Eduardo Torroja al cual personalmente le tengo mucho cariño que a pesar de mi juventud el siglo pasado eh, yo venía mucho por aquí puesto que estaba en los comités técnicos de la ENOR donde precisamente redactábamos ...y traducíamos la norma europea de protección del hormigón, la 1504... Eh, ...con el eh, fallecido Demetrio Gaspar, que era el presidente del comité... ...y yo era su secretario. Eh. Entonces, pasaba aquí muchas mañanas en una de esas salas... ...y bueno, pues para mí es un honor estar aquí. Además, el Instituto de Roboto Roja, a mí me gusta mucho no solo la edificación... Eh, sino porque yo creo que la construcción es una unión, precisamente, de la gente que la diseña, de los arquitectos, de los calculistas, los ingenieros de caminos y los químicos, tan importantes en la vida, puesto que trabajamos con los materiales. Es un poco la estructura que existe también en SICA. En SICA eh, es una compañía donde eh, hay mucha gente de diseño, hay mucha gente, hay muchos calculistas, muchos ingenieros de caminos y, por supuesto, hay muchos químicos. Yo espero que todos conozcáis a la empresa SICA, eh, una multinacional bastante importante, establecida en todos los países del mundo, y, bueno, pues un poco por... ...seguir con la historia, no con la charla que nos han dado antes tan bonita... ...un poco de la, de la empresa... Eh, ...para que veáis un poco lo que es SICA... ...la experiencia que SICA tiene en el mundo de la construcción... Eh, ...todo empezó con un visionario de estos locos... Eh, ...que en 1910, para cuando se estaba haciendo el túnel de Gotardo... Eh, tenían muchísimos problemas de, de entradas de agua y entonces él eh, se dio cuenta que con el silicato de uno de los silicato de potasio lo mezclaba con el cemento y hacía un aceleraba mucho el fraguado y iba tapando las entradas de agua eh. a raíz de eso empezó SICA de hecho se dice que el nombre de SICA proviene de el material que se está utilizando, silicato de potasio. ¿Eh? Otros dicen que era la, el nombre de la mujer, Silvia, y él que era Caspar Winkler. ¿Eh? Entonces, bueno, es una curiosidad. ¿eh? Con el paso del tiempo, eh, sí que se hizo, empezó a hacerse grande con la construcción de este túnel, ya sabéis que es una de las obras de ingeniería mayores del mundo, eh, pro, puesto que es un túnel bast de bastante longitud y a 2.000 metros de profundidad, porque encima tiene eh, los Alpes. ¿eh? Estaba leyendo que había tempera hay temperaturas de cuarenta y tantos grados en ciertas partes y entonces ha sido una obra muy complicada. ¿no? En el, los años 30 se empezó a comercializar productos a través de distribuidores aquí en España y en otros países, y ya en el 1954 se formó eh, SICA España, es decir, que tenemos ya eh, bastantes años de existencia. ¿no? Fueron pasando los tiempos, en el año 68 
se, se introdujo el, el famoso Sicaflés, ¿cuántos de ustedes han ido a una ferretería y han dicho un cartucho de Sicaflés? ¿no? Una masilla de poliuretano que es mundialmente conocida y es una referencia. O sea, la gente no dice una masilla, de usted una masilla de poliuretano? No, deme el Sicaflés. ¿no? Eh, en el año 74, Sica entra a formar parte de, la, de las acciones ahí en... La, en, en Zurich ¿eh? y ya se empiezan a lanzar gamas de productos para la reparación del hormigón la gama Sica Top eh, eh, la gama Sica Monotop son morteros para protección y reparación de, del hormigón eh, en el año 98 eh, SICA lanza los nuevos polímeros para como eh, plastificantes, super plastificantes del hormigón. Ya sabéis que inicialmente se empezó con los lignosulfonatos, que daban una reducción de cemento del orden del 10% en el hormigón, tenía problemas porque si uno se pasaba de dosificación tenía unos retardos importantes, posteriormente se descubrieron los betanaftalensulfonatos, se reducía mucho más, un 20%, pero había un problema con la trabajabilidad. Entonces, en planta se conseguía un hormigón buenísimo, una fluidez muy buena, y entonces se mandaba el camión a la obra. Claro, los atascos, el calor, cuando llegaba la obra el hormigón había perdido la, la trabajabilidad y ¿qué hacía el contratista? Échale agua. Se echaba agua, volvía otra vez el hormigón a resucitar, pero se había aumentado la relación agua-cemento, se habían llenado los, el hormigón de, de sus eh, una mala dosis y al final es un hormigón que con el futuro iba a resistir poco. Se pasó también a la melamina, el, que también daba una, un trabajo similar, esta no tenía color, por lo tanto ya se podía hacer hormigones blancos y posteriormente, en el año 98, se empezó a formular eh, la gama viscocrete, que es un polímero, son polímeros eh, tipo acrílicos, cuya reducción de agua llega hasta el 40%, te permite una tra trabajabilidad muy larga, sin reducción de resistencias mecánicas iniciales. Porque, antiguamente, cuando uno necesitaba, eh, oye, que es que, Estamos en España, en Madrid, a 40 grados, tengo que llevar hormigón a la obra y necesito que, bueno, pues se le echaba azúcares, historias que retrasaban el hormigón. Claro, al llegar a la obra, se habían pasado, el hormigón no fraguaba, en fin, follones. En este caso, estos productos, además de reducir tantísima cantidad de agua, eh, eh, se mantenía el, el cono. ¿no? En el 2010, hace nada... Eh, se cumplió los 100 años de existencia de la compañía, probablemente mucho de los que algunos de los que estáis aquí estuvisteis invitados a la inauguración eh, aquí en Madrid, a la, a la celebración. Eh, en, los años, en estos años se han desarrollado eh, tecnologías totalmente novedosas en el mundo de la construcción, como es el, el e -Cure, que es más para los poliuretanos, para evitar el problema que tienen los poliuretanos con el agua que reaccionan, forman burbujas, el e -Cure evita todos estos problemas. Ah, ya en estos años estamos hablando de que eh, SICA está establecida a nivel mundial, ya está facturando el orden de los 6 billones de francos suizos eh, y mmm, pues eso, ya estamos actuando en las últimas tecnologías como es el, la, la impresión a 3, a 3D, ¿no? Bueno, esto es un poco para contaros eh, que SICA eh, conoce el hormigón, sabe lo que es el hormigón. ¿Mm? ¿Por qué SICA está en este proyecto? ¿no? ¿Por qué? Eh, claramente SICA tiene unos eh, principios y una tradición en, en el diseño, en la innovación. Eh, uno, eh, si veis un poco los principios que están firmados por todos los jefazos mundiales, está claro que el primero es el cliente, el primero, lo más importante para sí que es el cliente, 
Pero el segundo, en importancia, es el coraje por la innovación, las ganas siempre de innovar, de buscar algo nuevo. Y es por eso que SICA le atraen estos proyectos. Es por eso que SICA quiere estar en proyectos innovadores como es este. ¿Eh? Eh, yo estoy hablando, yo trabajo aquí en SICA España, pero este proyecto lo lidera SICA Services, es decir, SICA Central. Eso que quede bien claro. Eh, también, por supuesto, la sostenibilidad, el respeto por el medio ambiente y, y los resultados, lógicamente. Los accionistas al final tienen que, que ganar su dinero. ¿no? Entonces, este coraje por la innovación eh, es lo que le ha dado nombre a SICA. ¿Por qué? Porque siempre ha desarrollado eh, nuevos productos, siempre ha estado a la vanguardia de los, de los sistemas y de los productos de construcción. Eh, siempre está implicada en eh, relacionadas con la universidad, con los institutos. La Universidad de Caminos de Madrid tiene su cátedra en arquitectura, tiene también sus premios. Yo creo que si sí, aquí hay ingeniero de caminos o arquitecto, todos habéis ido a los premios de, de SICA, al premio del prontuario, al premio de la mejor obra. Eh, en fin, está siempre donde está la, la innovación, ¿no? Eh, de hecho, ahora mismo en SICA eh, hay centros laboratorios en casi prácticamente todos los países, pero hay 20, en todo el mundo, 20 centros tecnológicos, uno de los cuales es Madrid, Alemania, Suiza, Inglaterra, eh, Holanda, Estados Unidos, Japón, China, Colombia, cada uno especializado en un tema. ¿eh? Actualmente, desde el año 2012, del año 2012, se han llegado a tener 412 nuevas patentes registradas y eso continúa, se potencia, es decir, la gente de I+.D. tenemos eh, una presión para que busquemos patentes, nuevos proyectos, etc. ¿no? Tenemos más de 900 eh, empleados dedicados exclusivamente al I+.D. y cuando digo exclusivamente al I+.D., es que, eh, lo que digo yo, que es algo que, que estamos metidos en I+.D., o sea, muchas veces no tenemos ni contacto con, con, con otros departamentos, ¿no? eh, en fin. Eh, bien, por supuesto, eh, uno de los, de los campos más importantes de, de SICA es el hormigón. SICA no fabrica hormigón, pero sabemos cómo se fabrica y ayudamos a que se fabrique un buen hormigón. Es uno de los de las motivos de que SICA tenga un departamento grandísimo de I más D para productos del hormigón. Este es el centro en Zurich de I más D, exclusivamente dedicado a I más D. ¿no? Entonces, eh, como os he comentado antes, eh, SICA pues, tiene esa gama tan completa de productos de todos los tipos para mejorar el proceso y la fabricación de un buen hormigón. El hacer un buen hormigón supone que el día de mañana la resistencia eh, y la durabilidad va a ser mucho mejor. Decía Gani que el hormigón es un material increíble, así lo es, y que también da mucha guerra, efectivamente la da, pero gracias a eso está, está, estoy yo trabajando y estamos en SICA trabajando, porque gracias a esos problemas que ha dado el hormigón, eh, tenemos muchos proyectos y trabajamos mucho para evitarlos. ¿Mm? Sabemos de la importancia estructural, sabemos de la importancia eh, que tiene el, el hormigón. ¿Mm? Eh, la palabra durabilidad es para nosotros pues muy importante. ¿eh? En sí que se trabaja muchísimo para eh, mantener el hormigón mmm, en su, en, su, en su estado casi como al inicio, durante el mayor tiempo posible. Se trabaja en muchísimas partes, se trabaja desde el aditivo, es decir, desde hacer un hormigón compacto, aprovechando bien la hidratación del cemento, hasta eh, la protección ante agentes externos. ¿no? Eh, es tan importante la, la durabilidad del, del hormigón que que existen departamentos exclusivos que trabajan en este tema. Yo, cuando antes Lucía comentaba la frase de permitirme coger el móvil, la frase de Torroja, 
yo curiosamente he aparcado ahí justo debajo, y yo lo he entendido de otra manera, quizá por, por de donde vengo, dice, antes por encima de todo cálculo está la idea moldadora del material en forma resistente para cumplir su misión, y entonces a mí la idea que me ha llegado es que además de los cálculos y de todo lo que, lo que hacen los ingenieros, los arquitectos, lo que es fundamental es conseguir un hormigón de calidad. Y yo creo que es ahí donde nosotros trabajamos. ¿Mm? Por lo tanto, constantemente estamos dando, eh, trabajando en el tema de durabilidad con un montón de folletos que se distribuyen al público, que se hacen cursos, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, es, tal la, es tal la importancia que se le da en SICA a la durabilidad que existe un departamento, tanto a nivel comercial como en el más de, dedicado exclusivamente a esta palabreja, que a mí me parece una palabreja que es refurbishment, que es la reparación, la restauración, la remodelación del hormigón. ¿eh? Eh, dentro de esta gama eh, trabajamos todo tipo de, de productos, eh, trabajamos la parte de eh, eh, los growth, o sea, los morteros de relleno, morteros de protección, eh, protectores de las armaduras, los coatings, por supuesto, y, y con nombres ya super, con, con nombres super conocidos como son la gama Sica Growth, los Sicalates, también es un nombre muy conocido a nivel eh, tienda, eh, los eh, Sica Ferrogar con hidrivedos de corrosión, los adhesivos, los Sicadures a base de resinas epoxi, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, también la fibra de carbono la cual se fabrica aquí, fabricamos aquí en Madrid, etcétera. Entonces, dentro de estas eh, aplicaciones, de, el, una de las partes importantes es la impregnación hidrofóbica, es una de las partes. Entonces, ¿cuáles son los retos que se nos presenta a nosotros en SICA con este proyecto? ¿Por qué SICA está interesado en este proyecto y quiere participar en este proyecto? Porque nosotros... Cuando hacemos el trabajo de restaurar o reparar un hormigón, eh, muchas veces, primero trabajamos en obra civil, y entonces lo que quiere solventar en una obra civil es, lógicamente, la seguridad. Y, por lo tanto, son acciones habitualmente que llamamos un poco destructivas, es decir, determinamos la, el problema que tiene el hormigón, lo reparamos, quitando la parte afectada y sustituyéndola. Claro. Eso en obra civil y luego protegiéndola para un futuro, con un coating que se le da color, etcétera, etcétera. Claro, eso en obra civil está muy bien, una torre de refrigeración de una central nuclear, por ejemplo, como se han hecho tantas, eh, queda precioso, recién reparada, eh, lleno de parches, eh, la armadura limpia, etcétera, etcétera, se le pinta... ...incluso cuando hasta con dibujitos, arbolitos... ...y queda una central nuclear preciosa... ¿eh? ...que a uno hasta le gusta la, la energía nuclear... ...el tema es... ...es el reto que se nos presenta en este proyecto... ...es decir, yo me imagino que al monumento de, de Gijón... ...de Eduardo de Chillida... ...yo me imagino que no le gustaría nada... ...que lo pintáramos de un RAL 7032, 7000 o que pusiéramos un par de parches ahí, ¿no? Eh, por lo tanto, es un proyecto muy interesante. Por supuesto, como ha dicho eh, eh, María Jesús al principio de la charla, ya existen en el mercado hidrofugantes, de hace muchísimo. ¿eh? Es conocidos por todos, si cagar 70, si cagar 711, productos, incluso vía disolvente y les da igual a la gente, lo aplican en la fachada... Al día siguiente le tiran un cubo de agua y hace el cubo. ¡Bruf! Y todo el mundo encantado, qué bonito, qué chulo. Pero son productos, sobre todo, dirigidos al mundo de la edificación, donde ese efecto es in, in, eh, bueno. ¿eh? A través de la 1504 se empezó a hacer más, eh, más eh, inca, incapé en la seguridad para el tema del hormigón estructural, ¿eh? diferenciando entre coatings, hidrofugantes y con unas normas muy específicas y muy severas para estos productos. No obstante, en el mundo del hormigón, los hidrofugantes, bueno, se utilizan, pero no tanto. En el caso de los conglomerantes, 
sobre todo su utilización ha sido siempre también en las fachadas, en el mortero cuando uno llegaba, ve, joder, hago así en el mortero y se cae todo, le he hecho un silicato de, de potasio, de sodio, y se me soluciona el problema, claro, luego unos problemones porque se echan así, empiezan a salir manchas blancas de la reacción con las cales que tiene eh, los morteros, y nunca, nunca ha sido algo que se apotecía. Por lo tanto, este trabajo con eh, materiales conglomerantes, cuya, cuya cristalización luego no tiene retracción, rellenan fisuras, con un efecto hidrofugante buenísimo, es una oportunidad de mejora bastante importante. Eh, el proyecto Innova Concrete eh, nos, eh, nos causó mucho interés porque es un proyecto que está muy bien organizado, es un proyecto con un plan de explotación y designación preparado, con un plan de comunicación importante, como es el curso que se está haciendo hoy, el que se va a hacer el, el pasado mañana en Gijón, como los que se van a hacer en otras partes del mundo, o sea, de Europa, y con una, eh, un mapa tecnológico muy bien organizado, muy bien preparado. ¿Eh? donde participan tanto institutos de renombre como es el Instituto de Doto Roja, hasta universidades mmm, destacadas, la Universidad de Cádiz, la Universidad de Creta y muchas universidades especialistas en este tema. ¿no? Este proyecto está apoyado en tres, en tres pilares, donde por un lado está la parte eh, cultural, donde tenemos perfectamente localizados las construcciones que se van a estudiar y eh, toda la historia que tiene esa construcción. Por otro lado, está apoyando otro pilar, que es la parte técnica, con una diferenciación técnica clarísima, como os he contado. ¿Eh? Son productos que, desde luego, nosotros estamos muy, muy interesados, porque es totalmente novedoso. Encima... Son productos donde se va a aplicar, se van a utilizar otras formas de aplicación, cosa que es interesante y novedosa en el mercado. Y un tercer pilar que es donde SICA va a apoyar, que es el mercado. SICA conoce perfectamente el mercado del, del hormigón, el mercado de la construcción, de productos de construcción, eh, porque estamos en todo el mundo. Y por lo tanto sabemos cómo introducir tecnologías nuevas. En, el, en este mercado, ¿eh? a través de comunicaciones, charlas constantes, eh, folletos, eh, eh, cursos en los colegios de arquitectos, de ingenieros, en las escuelas, eh, sabemos cómo cuando se introduce un producto hay que hacer un estudio del riesgo que significa introducir un producto. ¿Y qué me, qué, a qué me refiero con el riesgo? Es decir, un producto en la universidad, en el instituto, es mezclar un líquido con otro, como estaba haciendo eh, Rafa y su compañero ahí fuera. Claro, eso llevarlo a escala industrial es otra cosa. Y nosotros, cuando desarrollamos un producto antes de sacarlo al mercado, decimos, cuidado, ya tienes el producto, muy bien. Ahora, vamos a ver, tenemos materia prima, tenemos reactores donde hacerlo, tenemos... Cumple la normativa actual, nos, estamos en todos los comités eh, de normativos, conocemos la normativa, está el producto protegido intelectualmente y todo eso es lo que en SICA eh, vamos a apoyar y vamos a trabajar y vamos a dar nuestra experiencia. Eh, yo no, no sé, no he querido poner el logo para no hacer propaganda, pero si vosotros conocer, si ustedes conocen el logo, que es el famoso triángulo rojo, uh, hace unos años se puso abajo una frasecita, y esta frasecita es Building Trust, que es construyendo confianza, que es un poco lo que intentamos en la, en la compañía, es decir, dar confianza al mercado, no solo a los usuarios, sino también a los prescriptores, a los calculistas, y eso es en lo que trabajamos, en proyectos de innovación muy bien estudiados, muy bien calculados, 
yo por ejemplo estoy en un equipo global de I más D y, y, y yo por ejemplo cuando saco un producto, mi producto lo están probando en Malasia, en México, en China y toda esa información me va haciendo que modifiquemos el producto, es decir, que creamos productos que entran en el mercado sin problemas para crear confianza. Y por eso, como tenemos confianza, sí que, eh, sí que desde luego tiene confianza en este proyecto de Innova Concrete. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Es el momento del coloquio. Si los ponentes quieren hacer el favor de pasar... Antonio, puedes subir otra vez. Eh, tenéis... Eh, eh, es el momento del coloquio, lo va, el coloquio lo va a moderar eh, José Pedro Gutiérrez, profesor de investigación de aquí del Instituto. Él es doctor ingeniero de caminos, tiene pues eh, un, muchas eh, publicaciones, ha participado en muchos eh, proyectos. José Pedro, creo que tú estás ahí al final. <risa> Eh, tiene, eh, ha participado en muchas eh, eh, investigaciones tiene su propio grupo de investigación que se llama hormigones sistemas estructurales eficaces y eh, eh, digamos que además es un gran experto en eh, ha trabajado en más de 100 eh, casos eh, aquí al instituto eh, nos vienen casos de, bueno, de muchos tipos luego los jueces con nosotros se ceban entonces cuando hay un problema grave <ríe> tenemos que, que dar un estudio de patología aquí, pues da igual que se incendie el Windsor o que se caiga un puente, entonces eh, José Pedro siempre está involucrado en todos estos tipos de estudios entonces bueno, sin más eh, es el momento del coloquio eh, y ya... Buenos días. ¿Se enciende? ¿Se enciende? Buenos días a todos. Eh, en primer lugar, yo creo que debemos agradecer a los ponentes eh, los excelentes trabajos que nos han mostrado y así como las lecciones que, que hemos aprendido y que nos han querido transmitir. Entre ellas, yo creo que estaría en primer lugar eh, que en cualquier intervención hay que tener eh, un respeto y un cuidado o prevención o precaución. Luego también hemos aprendido en la segunda ponencia que hay que disponer de una metodología para hacer cualquier evaluación. Y entonces, muchas gracias, Paul, por esa metodología eh, excelente que nos has propuesto. Y por último, yo creo que eh, hay que conocer los materiales de reparación. Y ahí yo creo que Antonio nos ha dado pues, eh, una visión un poco de los productos que disponemos para esta reparación. Bueno, yo creía que era un, un experto en patología, pero después de escuchar a los ponentes vamos a, a dejarlo en un medio experto en patología. ¿no? Por lo tanto, gracias de nuevo a los ponentes. Y vamos a abrir el coloquio. En primer lugar, si hay alguna pregunta, evidentemente, si no, yo lanzaría algunas cuestiones que creo que han quedado como poco matizadas o poco conocidas dentro de las presentaciones que, que nos han hecho. O Así sea que, por favor, hay un micrófono para las preguntas. Hola, ahí está. Tengo una pregunta técnica para el señor Paul Godet. I have a technical question for you, Mrs. Godet. Um, regarding the formworks, have you been experimenting or addressing the linear patterns of wood, or have you studied that in order to maximize the technical texture of concrete? Eh, la pregunta es si él si han experimentado con las líneas y las marcas de los encofrados de madera en proyectos de conservación de hormigón. Gracias. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly which part you're speaking of. Um, with repair work, uh, certainly there's board form finish. That is that. Um, 
in what we've done on several projects, for instance, Errol Saarinen's uh, project out at Morrison and Urza Styles at Yale, um, they had to uh, find a particular species of wood and then cut, you know, cut it a certain way, polish it a certain way, um, which is always difficult. But even when we, uh, what we found is when that's done in a very exact, precise way, that's exactly what you usually you don't want to do because um, there's always a certain amount of variability that you have to replicate. And, and it's hard, especially in our world today, things are so exact and consistent. It's hard to take a highly trained craftsman and make them do a variable job. In other words, you gotta tell them, do a bad job. Because if it's really consistent, it'll, really, it'll stick out more than everything else. Is, is that where you're going? Yes. I was also wondering how we can interact or how we can include other technologies as well as wood and steel because we, although we are focusing here on concrete, that is also a major issue when working with concrete and all these things, right? Estaba diciendo que también era importante introducir otras tecnologías y otros tipos de cosas que se utilizan para construir con hormigón, como ser madera y metal, para también conseguir ese resultado final. Thank you. Gracias. Yeah, I think the the one point is it it doesn't just have to do with wood, but it has to do with um, all sorts of repair of of uh, concrete heritage. Is once again the variability to design in inconsistencies is, is very it's probably one of the most challenging parts to take a craftsman and go past that to a level of uh, once again variability of appearance thank you eh, Jose decías que los ponentes habían eh, demostrado tener un exquisito criterio y un exquisito proceso a la hora de intervenir en patrimonio, cosa que es fundamental. Eh, yo creo que hay una tercera cuestión que es fundamental a la hora de intervenir, que es tener sensibilidad, y creo que los tres han demostrado tenerla, y, y eso hace que sus intervenciones, sobre todo las que nos ha enseñado Paul, pues sean verdaderamente exquisitas. ¿no? A mí me impresiona el proceso que ha seguido Paul, o que sigue Paul en sus intervenciones, y lo miro con mucha envidia, porque desde luego en España me parece prácticamente imposible convencer a una propiedad que, eh, que invierta en ese proceso. ¿no? Eh, pero la, lo que me gustaría preguntarles a los tres, o a quien quiera de los tres, es eh, algo que a mí siempre me preocupa, que es ese grado de diferenciación cuando intervienes en patrimonio, y en el caso del hormigón quizás más difícil, entre lo nuevo y lo viejo, entre la reparación y, y, la, y, la, eh, y, la, y la obra. ¿no? Yo recuerdo, esta pregunta se la hacían a, a Gany Harbour en, en, una, en una conferencia que explicaba cómo intervenían los edificios de Mies, y él, que ya habla prácticamente como Mies, decía, uh, «If you are good, you will see». Uh, si eres bueno, notarás esa diferencia. ¿no? A mí me gustaría preguntarles, eh, sobre todo después de haber visto ayer en un taller de restauración del Museo del Prado, cuando intervenían en un, en un cuadro de Piero de la Francesca y nos explicaban cómo las reparaciones las hacían con un sistema que diferenciaba claramente la reparación de la obra. Eh, en el caso del hormigón, ¿Cómo creéis que podemos, o qué sistema creéis que podemos emplear para diferenciar la reparación o la sustitución del material existente? Muchas gracias. Quizás por orden, Nambi. Bueno, well, es de again, it depends on what, it depends on what you're, um, <coughs> on what you're repairing. In the case of concrete, uh, we did this extensive project on the restoration of Unity Temple, which, as I mentioned, was a cast-in-place concrete building that had a subsequent repair technique where they completely resurfaced the whole building in the 1970s with a sh shotcrete, with a pneumatically applied concrete. And in the repair, uh, the restoration project was to repair the 1970s shotcrete, which is one, one image I showed, or the one slide I had with the three images on it. Um, the, the goal was that you wouldn't have these patches jump out, so it would, it would 
ruin your experience of looking at the what was supposed to be a monolithic facade. Um, although even when it was first built, it wasn't exactly all the same. As Paul said, there was imperfections even in the original. And so the key is to try to, to do it in a way that that doesn't draw unnecessary attention to it. Because I think it's virtually impossible to make it completely go away. You can make it almost go away, and for the passerby or the average person sort of looking at it, they should they should say, oh, this looks good. It doesn't look, you know, you can't really see it. But just like the painting conservator, when they're dealing with a painting of the quality that we were seeing, you don't want to be call your attention to it, but you should be able to find it when you need to. So that that's always what we try to do. And uh, sometimes we're more successful than others, but it's it's seldom the problem of never having, not never seeing it. It's really more the other problem of not seeing it too much. Yeah, um, I'll just. Uh, yeah, I, I have an interesting story. I remember this is probably 30 years ago when the uh, differentiation was was being talked about uh, quite a bit, and a contractor had tried to do some work, and it it was woefully off. It, it just wasn't even close to matching. They said, "Yeah, I'm trying to differentiate, and uh, so, <laughs> I'm trying to make it look as different as possible." And we're thinking, well, he was successful at that, but it certainly wasn't successful with his repair. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think Gunny's right. Um, I agree with him 100% that you, you, concrete's a fairly visually forgiving uh, media um, to look at. And I think um, when you do go with something that's perfectly consistent, it will stick out. And I think the idea, the, the idea is to make it match or not be as noticeable as possible. The, the challenges with our work, and I think what we're trying to tackle here is, even if you make something match today, 10 years from now it won't. Yeah. Um, because usually um, it's hard to make a material um, to the same, pro probably low qualities of what was used originally. So certainly the patch material will degrade less over time. So over time will begin to probably be more visually apparent. Uh, but that's one of the challenges we have to come up with and why you want to be very careful in your, your, your design of your repairs. Yo, yo como he comentado antes, eh, es el, el, el reto y el, la oportunidad para, para SICA, porque normalmente las reparaciones mm, suelen ser destructivas, es decir, es quitar lo que hay dañado es poner algo nuevo, lógicamente con otro color, otra historia, y habitualmente eh, cubrirlo con un coating, un recubrimiento. ¿no? Entonces, es de las cosas que yo lo comentaba antes con, con Luis, eh, digo, ¿te imaginas en el monumento de tu padre ahí hacer un, quitar y ponerle ahí un parche? De, dice, no, no me lo imagino. Entonces, es precisamente la, la oportunidad. Hay muchísimas experiencias. Yo la última que tengo es en, en Panamá, el edificio de la administración, de, que es el edificio más importante de, de Panamá. En 2014 hacían los 100 años y pidieron que se rehabilitara la, la fachada, que estaba totalmente fisurada y tal. Y bueno, lo que se hizo fue mezclar los áridos de la zona eh, con, con una, una resina y se hizo un recubrimiento y quedó precioso el edificio, todo homogéneo, todo bonito, pero quizá eh, pierde un poco la, la naturalidad un poco del, del tema mineral. ¿no? Entonces, ese es uno de los retos importantes. Muchas gracias. Marcos, yeah, tienes... I had, I had one point I wanted to add. Um, uh, one thing I think uh, as far as you, is when you start to see this industry mature, like uh, Sika, um, most of its products are very high strength um, in very quick setting, uh, but in recent years they've started to develop uh, slower setting materials and lower strength materials which match more to the original concrete, which I think should be uh, complemented um, because I think they see that, that that will work, it will have more longevity than some of these uh, hybrid materials. Mm -hmm. yeah. eso, eso es verdad, muchas veces existe un poco la, la las ganas de cuando uno quita un trozo de hormigón que está dañado, reponer con algo que, porque se hace muy a nivel comercial, esto resiste 50, 60, 
newtons y resulta que el hormigón que uno tiene al lado no tiene ni la mitad. Entonces el problema que hay luego son los movimientos, por lo tanto ya no solo es que quede el parche de otro color, sino que encima empiezan las fisuras y los problemas posteriores. And, and one other um, comment that came to my mind when, when both of them were speaking, and that is the issue of patina, or patina, as I've heard it said here. Um, with concrete, it's critical because concrete does develop depending on what kind of cement was used. I mean, there are a lot of factors that, that have a, a effect, but oftentimes it has a very characteristic color that cr comes out over time. And as soon as you do the patch, and even being able to predict how the patch will patinate over time is very difficult. So um, it, it's something that when you have that case, it's very hard to figure out what to do. But you have to try. Well, thank you for all these very interesting presentation. My question would be, uh, you've presented two approaches. I mean, uh, the American approach is pouring some new concrete. And the SICA approach is slightly different because we talk about patching some mortars. So first, uh, it's a, a slight opposition between the two approaches. W what are, are your feeling about that? Second point, Gunny, you did uh, mention the sustainability and durability. So coming back to the two approaches, do, would you have some experience to share with us with the two approaches? What would be the best? Pouring some new concrete that could fit with a visible aggregates and so on, or patching some, some mortars? Um, your question is primarily to do with uh, concrete versus mortar? Okay, um, I, I, I much prefer to use simpler materials and, uh, you know, with all the chemistry aside, um, there's one thing in concrete that doesn't change and that is, well, hopefully it doesn't change, is the aggregate and the, the fine and the coarse aggregate. Everything else is a chemistry process. Um, so you do get shrinkage, you do get um, other things that can happen. So if your aggregate's stable, it's dimensionally stable. Um, and, and it allows a, a much more stable uh, material that will grow and shrink more comparable to your existing concrete if that's what it is. Um, so that's my preference um, to use and I think time has shown, at least in my experience over the last 40 years, that uh, you know concrete as a repair material is usually uh, more durable, um, in the, at least in my opinion, than some of these um, hybrid materials that tend to be too rich, too fast. Um, you know, the modulus of elasticity is different. There's a lot of things that come into play. But I think uh, simpler, closer to the original material usually uh, works the best. No, si dentro de, dentro de la gama que, que tenemos en, en SICA y en otras casas, eh, hay una gran gama de productos que se suelen ajustar. Normalmente, eh, como hemos contado, eh, eso se trabaja mucho en SICA, es decir, no es yo te vendo tantas toneladas de este mortero y gano mi dinero y me voy, no, porque lo que hemos dicho al final, no queremos crear confianza, entonces hay muchas veces, incluso SICA tiene ciertos negocios como RISC, es decir, eh, va a ser un problema, no nos metemos, aunque perdamos dinero, entonces quiere decirse con esto que a veces es posible utilizar materiales, otras veces no, y a veces necesita el diseño de un nuevo material, y es precisamente por lo cual este proyecto es el, el interés que le vemos, ¿no? es un proyecto que nosotros ahora mismo tenemos productos similares, que los tienen otras casas también, pero este producto es específico y puede cubrir una, una parte que nosotros no, no, no teníamos. Uh, and, and does does SICA consider the eventuality of, of uh, designing some concrete to, for, for repair instead of only mortars? They do design concrete. For repair? Yes. Yeah, it's, um, and once again, I, I think it's, 
at least in the in the U.S. Uh, North America, they have it, but um, and, and we tend to go that direction, or we add it to the mix uh, as often as we can. Um, and once again, I, I I acknowledge that I think that's a positive step to uh, ask the materials to do less sometimes, because mm -hmm. I think the more you ask a material to do, um, the, you're lowering your tolerances. Um, so once again, I they do. Uh, they do make materials with aggregate, but it's a local aggregate, so you have to make sure the aggregate's good. But I would I would just add to to Paul's comment that the way I think about it as an architect is that it, it first of all you want to get the best information, so you want to try to fully understand the range of options you have. Cost is often a mitigating factor that the architect has a hard time working with, and and. Uh, as Fernando pointed out, that he was in awe of the work that they were able to do because they were they were able to do it in a way that they felt they needed to. And cost, I'm sure, was a factor, but it wasn't the factor. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. But you also, when you say sustainability, you have to think about what is the best long-term effect for the building, not just the short-term effect. And what does it mean if, if you know that the patch is only going to last for a short time, it, it fills your immediate need, it solves your budget problem, but it doesn't uh, solve a long-term problem and has to be redone again in 10 years. That's not, a good, that's not a good use of money, which is another resource that we have to think about. So all those things come into play, and part of the architect's role uh, as typically the leader is to help navigate that difficult um, decision-making tree with the owner to make sure they understand what it is they're getting so that there's not a disappointment at the other end. This is the part of the, the managing the um, expectation and understanding of what you're going to get at the uh, end of the project. Well, thank you for your answers. And just last question. Could you share with us your experience about durability? Um, concrete versus mortar, 10 years, 5 years? What is the m most durable? Are you asking about the service life? Yeah, um, of the I, service life of the repair. I, I think that's... Um, and, and could you try to give some figures? Uh, I mean, uh, 10 years for a concrete, five years for a mortar, or the same, or whatever? I, you know, I think it's, it's like many things in, uh, in what we do. It depends. Um, it's, it's, there's so many variables in place. I know there's a real push to define service life with some exactness, but I think it's a little fleeting um, in that respect. Um, I, I, th I really think so often the repair material depends on its surrounding materials. Uh, it depends on the techniques that were used. And the actual material itself is just one of 10 components um, that have to do with the durability. Um, I think, as you pointed out, the, you know, if the protection system can be utilized, uh, and once again, if, if the patch can be done correctly, the surface preparation, the techniques that are used, um, certainly um, a better contractor um, and craftsmanship will allow for a longer service life, which has nothing to do with the material. The material certainly, you know, once again, I, I, I think the dimensional stability is important, um, which aggregate gives you. Um, I think, uh, using higher tolerance materials is sometimes appropriate. I think in coming closer to your original material and be more compatible um, is important. So I, I did not answer your question. <laughs> Surely not, but thank you for trying. paso del tiempo, la pátina que deja el tiempo, sé que alguno de vosotros gane lo piensa más, pero como las cosas, él muchas veces decía que si una escultura griega la viésemos hoy en día como se hizo hace siglos, no nos llenaría, mientras que la podemos ver mutilada con un paso del tiempo y nos produce un sentimiento, una sensibilidad diferente. Entonces, a mí me gustaría un poco que hablaseis o meditaseis un poco sobre ese tema de cómo se puede no parar el tiempo, porque el tiempo nunca se podrá parar, 
pero sí que las evoluciones de alguna manera se perciba ese tiempo que ha transcurrido desde que una obra está pues a la intemperie, como se podría decir. I, I might I might turn it around on you and say what was he thinking uh, using concrete because because he must have studied the material and understood the material had very specific qualities and one of those qualities is not only does it patina but it actually erodes right because every time it rains a little bit more disappears and uh, some some concrete is better than others and and but it all does that so. There must have been some. I would assume that there would an understanding that this is going to be how it will eventually come to be, and this is something you have to sort of live with. I do think that that part of what we're trying to do with the Innova Concrete Project is to find ways to slow down the process. We will not eliminate the process. Mother Nature is relentless, and we're going to. Those processes are not things we can. I mean, we change them. We're changing them now, but not in a positive way. Uh, it's something that we can't control, overly control, but we can do things to help slow it down. I think that's the best we can hope for, unfortunately. Yeah, um, some thoughts on that are, um, you know, some of the best ways to slow down you know, concrete deterioration is if, um, what, at least what I've seen, if it's unreinforced, um, going back to old school, um, you know, you take away the corrosion process, uh, if you, for example, in forts that I've seen from the 1800s going through after World War II, the later additions <coughs> deteriorated much more rapidly uh, because they had uh, reinforcing steel. But it's hard to compare a 10 foot or um, a three or four meter wall to a um, to a, a slab that's reinforced on a, on a coastal fortification. But other things, you know, whether if you're on the ocean with trade winds. Um, you know, certainly you'll have uh, different amounts of exposure. Um, even with, if you have exposed aggregate, tends to, um, sometimes you'll see it patina less because you're really looking at the aggregate, you're not looking at the paste. Um, some things to consider as part of your repair work. But I think what I, I always get nervous about is, um, and we've seen this in the past, especially in the 60s and 70s, is very aggressive protection systems being installed, ruining um, the concrete surface or ruining the, the concrete structure and you really want to be careful about that is um, um, in in the business I'm in our, our bread and butter is fixing problems um, and usually you know newer things tend to have uh, they just don't understand the potential yet so it's that's a good thing that Innova Concrete's doing is it's studying the effects it's you know listening it's trying to work through the problems and I think that's very very important because certainly 10, 20 years, you're much smarter than you are today. Thank you. Eh, voy a una frase realmente bonita, que era que el tiempo pinta. Eh, y es verdad, el tiempo pinta como... ¿no? En, sus, en sus obras. Eh, a mí me parece casi imposible limpiar un monumento sin quitar la patina no, yo, yo no he encontrado el sistema de hacerlo y a lo mejor tendríamos que discutir si hay que limpiar un monumento eh, también tenemos que diferenciar entre suciedad y patina no es lo mismo un monumento se puede eh, ensuciar y a lo mejor hay que limpiarlo pero la patina que pone el tiempo eh, es algo eh, que es muy difícil de mantener cuando intervienes en una limpieza de un monumento. Y en el caso del hormigón, a mí me parece prácticamente imposible. ¿no? Eh, por otra parte, en la aplicación de productos, precisamente para proteger ese, ese monumento de, de perjuicios climáticos, lo que evitan es que la, el tiempo actúe sobre la pátina, y lo que evita es que esa pátina siga cambiando, lo cual también es malo, porque hay que dejar que las cosas envejezcan. Me gustaría, que, si sois capaces, de establecer un poco cuál es ese límite entre dejar, a, dejar que un edificio respire y envejezca ¿eh? Eh, sin impedírselo o eh, hasta qué punto podemos limpiar 
si es posible limpiar sin que tampoco se pierda ese carácter eh, que la pátina genera, ¿no? Sí, de, desde luego que es, que es un tema complicado, o sea, precisamente, como os he dicho, yo desde el punto de vista de la empresa fabricante de, de productos, bueno, pues aquí nosotros somos, vendemos productos, por lo tanto, eh, no estamos muy en ese, en ese tema dándole vueltas, ¿no? Lo que está claro es que productos que protegen o que evitan la entrada, evitan que se ensucie, pues está claro que van a aumentar la vida de ese, de ese monumento, eso, eso está clarísimo, porque dentro del hormigón, eh, primero el hormigón es un material vivo y segundo que dentro del hormigón está la estructura eh, de acero, ¿no? y ese acero si se corroe eh, aumenta de volumen, si aumenta de volumen rompe el hormigón, si se rompe el hormigón se cae, o si no entran aguas, hielos, historias y el, se termina destruyendo, ¿no? Entonces, protectores los hay y yo creo que aumentan la vida. Y lo que decía antes una persona que era, ¿y cuánto más? Pues, pues esa es la pregunta que nos hacen a nosotros. Nosotros tenemos máquinas de envejecimiento acelerado y nos dicen siempre, ¿y esto cuánto, este producto cuánto más dura que el otro? Bueno, pues es que depende de dónde esté, depende si está en Gijón dándole la corriente o si está aquí en Madrid con una contaminación o si está, es, es complicado. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, it, and really what makes it complicated is I think uh, cleaning should not be looked as a, like an easy step. And, and the, the cleaning component should be um, definitely a fully developed discussion and repair option. For instance, uh, one building I worked on, a brutalist building, that, that first they used a bush hammer, um, then they sandblasted it, then they acid washed it. And so needless to say, 25 years later, uh, when repair work was going to be done because it absorbed water incredibly, it had, they used a uh, hydrochloric acid to, um, a, you know, further abrade the surface, so it had, it had a chloride, high chloride level, um, was how do you replicate that? You know, it was next to impossible because it's going to degrade more quickly than anything you can do. You're not going to put a patch material on and do all that damage to it and hope that it's going to... Uh, fade the same. So that was something that had to be wrestled with um, over the time. Also, probably the biggest problem is the patina component where the original concrete would get dirty so much more quickly. And uh, how do you combat that? There's no right answer. So there has to be a balance and that's part of the discussion. And I think that's, that's the collaborative component that I think all the speakers have talked about um, in developing of the options. When usually there is no perfect answer, there's just kind of a compromise. Una otra pregunta, por favor. Bueno, si acaso voy a lanzar yo alguna cuestión. Eh, en general, creo que estamos hablando de hormigones eh, en arquitectura, ¿no? o, o en obras monumentales, o en monumentos. Y me gustaría también hablar un poco la experiencia que puedan tener los ponentes en los hormigones de las presas. España, como sabéis, en el siglo pasado se construyeron eh, muchas presas que actualmente van a empezar a cumplir 100 años. O sea, son ya hormigones centenarios. Y creo que estamos muy preocupados, en general, de qué va a pasar con estas presas. Porque inmediatamente habrá que hacer una intervención, una reparación, o incluso habrá que dejarlas fuera de servicio. No sé si los ponentes tienen experiencia en este tipo de hormigones centenarios o casi centenarios, y qué soluciones de reparación, si son más específicas o más concretas, o requieren una tecnología un poco especial para poder, digamos, aliviar las presiones que tienen y tensiones que tienen y deformaciones que tienen este tipo de, de estructuras. Bueno, yo, aunque estoy en la, metido en eh, I más D, eh, conozco bastante... Eh, bueno, en general, una generalidad de los productos, no puedo especificar la obra, la problemática, pero sí que es verdad que se está trabajando muchísimo en el tema de inyecciones. O sea, sí es verdad que los hormigones están, tienen muchas de ellas tienen fisuras, 
por la presión que recibe, también por el hormigón en su día que se hizo, ¿no? Y entonces está utilizando mucho la, el tipo de inyecciones. Es, es un mundo apasionante porque, eh, por lo visto, cuando se inyecta, cruje la, la presa, ¿no? Es, es, un, es algo espectacular, ¿no? Entonces están eh, trabajando con, con inyecciones con resinas epoxi, con, también hay muchos huecos de, del lavado o bien de, de un problema de, eh, decimos coqueras, ¿no? o, o bien de, de, de un mal hormigón y entonces está haciendo con espumas eh, acuarreactivas, eh, que son espumas de poliuretano que se les mete dentro unos áridos y crean un mortero no de la resistencia del hormigón, pero un mortero con una cierta resistencia para que ocupe ese hueco. ¿no? Luego también, lógicamente, pues claro, pues a ver, pues vamos a, a, a proteger el, el paramento aguas arriba, ¿eh? con revestimientos pues que hagan impermeable eh, el, el este. bueno, Generalmente los hormigones están saturados, las mm. presas como saben. No, y eso bueno, puede ser una solución pero no sé si su durabilidad ¿eh? o requeriría una intervención cada un cierto sí. periodo de años. No, yo sé que hay ahora mismo empresas que se dedican exclusivamente al tratamiento de presas y que están todo el día inyectando porque ven entradas, ven fisuras. Y... Sí, por favor, Paul. Sí, yeah, um, at least the way... Uh... In the U.S., which is most where most of my experience is, or in the in North America, the the dams are usually taken care of on a more infrastructure basis because you really can't see a lot of them, um, as you described. I think a lot of the upstream or water side of the dam is taken care of by liners, injection, things of that nature. But the concrete heritage component, which is usually at the top of the dam, or ancillary components, which may be a, a visitor center, and those other things are taken care of by conventional ones. Uh, most of the, the dam construction we have in North America, or at least in the U.S., was done during the Depression, uh, which is in the <clears throat> um, 30s, and so a lot of that is starting to age. For instance, Hoover Dam, um, which I was doing some work on, on that one, it was uh, mostly the visitor center, and the uh, the plazas at the top are usually handled in the kind of the normal I, I guess to say normal but uh, what we would all consider a more traditional um, cultural her heritage uh, technique but the the bulk of the dam you're exactly right is handled um, by an infra in an infrastructure way which is fast short term um, but it's just a mass construction I mean these are incredibly large um, structures Um, and really, you can't see most of it, so I think it's the, the drive of it has been towards maintaining it structurally, not necessarily the... Uh, I think they're looking at it from a durability standpoint, too, but a lot of it's injection, liners, uh, things of that nature, which I don't think will have the longest um, run, but they do work on a temporary basis, and they do reduce the leakage, which is usually the driving force. I have not yet had the pleasure of working on a dam, <laughs> but I look forward to it. But I think I do think that with an infrastructure project like that, a civil any civil project, frankly, bridges, highways, uh, which get re rebuilt all the time. We have historic highways in the United States that uh, almost don't exist anymore. I mean, they, the the route is there, but not the physical thing. So I think it it goes again to understanding what the resource is and what are the values that are intrinsic in that thing, both the physical thing and the idea of the thing and understanding that and then working towards how to acknowledge that and preserve or save that, um, which may not actually be the physical thing. I mean, I, as great as the dams are that were built during the Depression, I would imagine 300 years from now they will have been completely replaced because if they have to function in order to do their work, Uh, that may just be the material reality of what we're talking about. So, not everything can be the pantheon. I was going to say possibly not. I just saw Hoover Dam last week, and the water's down about halfway. So, uh, may, maybe due to a changing environment, we won't need it, in the, unfortunately, in the future. But we'll see how that goes. Una última pregunta me dicen. Bueno, pues la voy a hacer yo, también breve, espero. Ah, perdón. 
Bueno, entonces, penúltimo. Gracias. relación con, bueno, una relación de puntos que cada uno de vosotros ha sacado. Gani ha, ha comentado eh, el hecho de que es importante, uno de los aspectos más importantes es actuar lo menos posible. Por otro lado, Paul mencionaba que para poder hacer una buena actuación se requiere de especialistas, tanto técnicos, bueno, principalmente arquitectos, ingenieros, químicos, especialistas en la materia. Asimismo, un constructor que tenga experiencia en este tipo de obras porque es muy particular y luego una cosa que ha comentado así por encima eh, Fernando que es cómo ha conseguido Paul convencer a las propiedades para realizar estos proyectos ¿no? eh, yo quiero lanzar una bueno pues una llamada de atención un poco al proyecto a todas las socios del proyecto de, de cómo llamar la atención si tenemos una intervención mínima que sea el que haya interés en hacerla desde el punto de vista económico de las partes que intervienen. Porque si es muy pequeño la intervención y requiere grandes especialistas por todas las partes, al final saldrá muy, saldrá muy caro y el, y el propietario no querrá hacerlo. ¿no? Y dejará que el, el monumento, la estructura, se degrade hasta un nivel en el que pues quizás es ya demasiado tarde y, y la reparación va a dañar eh, el aspecto que, que queremos que tenga esa estructura. Well, it's it's part of the beauty of what we're trying to do with the Innova Concrete Project because it's more it's more about getting in early and doing preventative work in a way that that will keep it from getting to the level that we're talking about. But yeah, I I think you're right. We need to find good ways to to convince clients to keep on the front end, be, be ahead of the maintenance instead of waiting for it to be a problem. This is this doesn't matter for concrete buildings, it's true for every building. It's always a problem. Yeah, I, I agree with Gunny, um, but I also wanted to uh, push back a little bit on the premise that it's more expensive to uh, gather experts. Um, and, and experts is probably an overused term, but I think, um, to the tenth time you've done something, you know much more than you did the first time, and uh, I, I think it's it's important to, and, and actually more efficient and less expensive to um, have somebody work on something who's done it before. Um, certainly, as an owner of a over a, over a, a monument or something of of uh, you know, real heritage value, you know, you really want someone who's got experience so they don't you can get further down that road before you start getting into mock-ups um, there's I, I think there's nothing more expensive than someone with very little experience and they use materials that are inappropriate and then you have a repair that's not durable and, and I think that's the most expensive route you can take uh, but because it, it takes a long it takes a little more time and it's done poorly and you're paying for it again in a few years I think you know once again expertise doesn't it's 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 not more expensive. You usually can get to your resolution a little bit more quickly. Thank you. Yo, yo esa es precisamente la parte importante en el grupo en el grupo cinco de explotación y de comunicación. Es decir, hay que trabajar muchísimo ahí. Ahí tenemos muchísima experiencia de, de cuando se necesita un producto porque es la solución. Finalmente el proyectista, el propietario lo entiende y lo paga. Eso es así. Nosotros tenemos cantidad de productos, eh, por ejemplo, temas ambientales, ¿no? que hay mucha gente que a mí que no me cuentes a mí el precio, pero hay gente, hablo por ejemplo de suelos epoxi, mucha gente, me da igual que tenga nonilfenoles, me da el que sabe, las empresas serias lo pagan. Lógicamente, lo que hay que trabajar es para informar a los propietarios, a las ingenierías, a los proyectistas de la solución y, de la, y que el aplicador es un aplicador bueno y, y formado para este tema. Eso es, yo creo que se puede solventar. Bueno, pues muy bien, muchas gracias. Simplemente, quizás una última reflexión. 
y me atrevería a apuntar un nuevo camino de investigación futura, como sería el seguimiento de las reparaciones realizadas. Creo que a partir de ahora ya tenemos experiencia, 25, quizás 50 años, las antiguas, que podemos ir, digamos, viendo cómo se comportan estas reparaciones, y yo creo que sería muy útil, y sobre todo para los, los fabricantes de estos productos, saber cómo se comportan sus materiales. Y también eh, ver cuántas veces vamos a reparar en el futuro, una, dos, tres veces, las que sean necesarias, hasta dónde hay que llegar en este tema. Pues muchas gracias a los ponentes por sus ponencias y por contestar a todas las preguntas. Gracias.